Good evening and welcome to TDM Talk Show. The British presence in Macau dates back to the 18th century, 200 years before colonial Hong Kong was founded. The community's activity here was closely linked with the Canton system, which regulated foreign trade with China and operated for some 150 years. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the Anglophone communities in Macau and China used Chinese pidgin English in their communication with the Chinese servants and trade partners. Our guest is an expert in the British presence in Macau and also on Anglo-Portuguese studies. Rogério Puga is an assistant professor at Nova University in Lisbon and was also previously an assistant professor here in Macau at the University of Macau. Professor Rogério Puga, welcome to the show. Thank you very much Thank for you. joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, let's start by talking about how, when, and why you first encountered uh, this uh, uh, kind of field of research on the British presence in Macau and Anglo-Portuguese studies related to Macau. Well, um, I've always had an interest in uh, Macau, uh, well, uh, per se, but as I did English and Portuguese studies, I realized that there was a void an empty space to be filled in the, the uh, regarding the, the research and on the history of Macau, which was the cross cross referencing Portuguese and English sources to reveal secrets on the other side of on the other version of the history of Macau. So I decided to research on English sources uh, regarding the British presence and then the American North American presence in Macau, and then cross reference it with Portuguese sources, but mainly researching. English sources on the history of Macau, um, and that, that was how it all started. So my, my interest in Portuguese studies and English studies and getting these two interests together. Uh, when you look back at your early writings and research and uh, the way everything started out, uh, uh, do you still regard or you regard yourself as a Portuguese scholar looking into the British presence in Macau, or you try to distance yourself distance yourself from the fact that you are Portuguese and there's a sort of Portuguese approach to Macau? Oh, as as, as a, an academic, yeah. as a scientist, of social course or of course. scientist or as, uh, cultural studies or historian, I try to distance myself of course. regarding both the Portuguese and the uh, British sources and come up with the uh, closest version of what really happened. It, of course, it's not. It's never. We can never access the past with a hundred percent. Of course. Uh, you know, being sure that it's a hundred percent faithful to what happened. But uh, so we try to be as uh, critical and as neutral as as, pos as possible. Of course, our own interests, our own vision of the world, sometimes interfere. In, in our writing, you know, in the way we write and the way we perceive things, but it is our duty to uh, be as neutral as possible. So I do try to be as neutral as possible. And that, that's why the cross-referencing of sources so is, is so important. Uh, well, carrying out that work was, I'm sure there were, you, you came across um, very interesting features, but was there anything that was particularly surprising for you in, in the way uh, those uh, English language sources were portraying Macau? Yes, well, the, the personal interests of who wrote those sources, whether it was a missionary, a trade, a businessman, a woman, uh, a woman missionary, a, 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 a female missionary, a male missionary. Um, so the context of production of those sources are, are, is relevant and it has to be taken into account when we are reading those sources. Some of them were manipulated to convey an, in, an idea that interested whoever had commissioned that writing or whoever was writing. So, But the Protestant gaze on Macau, the North American and English gaze on Macau, is a very interesting one and very different from the Portuguese gaze on, on Macau. For instance, Protestant writers would complain about the bells ringing every hour, <laughs> yeah. which is something which was something that didn't happen in Philadelphia or any other Protestant city at the time and happened in Macau. And a Portuguese writer would have never mentioned that because that already happened in Portugal. So this Protestant gaze is very interesting. Um, and also they reveal a lot of 
uh, Macau, they, they, uh, I became more aware of the fact that any space in the world, it's not only one space. A city or a town like Macau is, which Macau resembled more of a town than a city in the 19th century, but um, when you think about Lisbon or London or sure. Berlin or Paris, um, a, a, a city is always a set of different cities. If I lived in the Chinese citadel, I would have one idea of Macau. If I lived in the Christian part of Macau, I would have a completely different... And then even different neighborhoods are different Macau. So uh, you become aware of that when you read different versions of what happened uh, in, in Macau. And of course, these um, Anglophone writers were trying to decodify Macau. They encountered two exotic others, not only the Chinese. They had never socialized with Catholics. So a Chinese procession was as exotic or strange as a Portuguese or procession, a Catholic, Catholic mm -hmm. uh, procession. And many of these sources, like for instance, female um, diaries, diaries, ri diaries written by the women of American merchants that came to uh, Macau for four or five, six years, um, they allow us to study the everyday life of 19th century Macau, probably like any other source, because they were... Uh, um, and a case in point in this respect is, of course, uh, Harriet Lowe's diaries. Yes, um, she came to Macau in the 1820s, well, late 1820s, with her uncle and aunt. 1829, right? Yes, 1829. 1833, 30, 32, because she leaves, yes. and then the diary continues uh, throughout their journey. But, um, yes, uh, uh, they would write daily uh, journals, uh, and they would describe every single aspect of Macau's daily life, from the dogs barking, to the curtains, to the uh, servants, how they dealt with the servants, what language they spoke to communicate with the servants, for instance, Chinese pidgin English. Mm -hmm. um, and they are very valuable sources for historians and social scientists, like anthropologists, sociologists, to study the everyday life of 19th century uh, Macau. And in my personal case, they have allowed me to um, well, uh, discover different aspects of Macau's uh, life in the 19th century, for instance, the, the founding of the first uh, Western-styled uh, museum in China, which most of the historians... British Macau Museum, yeah, the right? the British Macau Museum, yes, from which opened its doors between 1829 and 1834, when the monopoly of the East India Company ends. Um, and these diaries mention that museum, uh, and I, as I was reading these diaries, which I, which I am still studying, uh, I became aware of like line by line. It was you know two lines in one diary, the other two lines in another diary. Uh, it led me to research on that museum and to be able to find out that the first museum to open its doors in China was not the Shanghai Museum in 18, 1868, but the Macau Museum in 1829. So um, obviously these personal accounts, these autobiographical and intimate accounts of Macau do encapsulate um, personal and subjective visions of Macau. So you have to read them with a pinch of salt. Of course. Very <laughs> carefully because they are subjective. Uh, although they are diaries, they are um, subjective interpretations and readings of, of, of Macau, narratives of Macau. Uh, but they do allow you to um, make such discoveries. So they are extremely important uh, historical sources on the history of Macau. And while cross-referencing the sources, I mean Portuguese and English sources, in Portuguese and English, uh, have you come across any specific event uh, or phenomenon where you have very different or perhaps opposite or contradictory accounts of uh, what was being described? In what way? Um... In the way that like uh, a perception or a certain phenomenon is uh, entirely different as, as if you are not in the same place? Mm -hmm. Not as extreme as mm -hmm. that. There were, of course, Nuances, differences. Right? There were things that the British didn't want to convey or to uh, communicate to the East India Company that we find in the Portuguese sources and mm -hmm. vice versa, but there's nothing that extreme um, that I can think of now. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
when we think about the British presence in Macau in the 19th century, of course, we will inevitably talk about the uh, British romantic painter George Chinnery. Is, is, is an icon of the British presence, of course. Um, interestingly, when we look at his paintings, what we see is basically uh, Chinese people, the Chinese city, and we seldom see any Westerner or mm -hmm. Portuguese aside from some priests. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on, on, on this? Um, I think the exotic is part of the romantic poetics or aesthetics, uh, like the ruins after a typhoon. He sure. would paint the ruins of Macau after a, a typhoon. Um, so the exotic other would have been very appealing to uh, the British um, public at the time, and he, he knew that mm -hmm. much more than painting Portuguese buildings, colonial architecture, which he also did. So he, uh, the traders would commission uh, work portraits from him, but he usually would leave his home at, in the morning with a stall and paper and a, a pencil, and he would. Uh, uh, paint or draw, uh, tanker women, fishermen, right. um, gamblers, Chinese barbers, street sellers. Um, so he, um, when we think about the visual culture of 19th century Macau, George Chinnery is the first um, personality that comes, or artist that comes to mind before the creation, the invention of photography. Photography, of course. But yes, it is the Chinese uh, dimension, uh, even through junks, which he also drew, Tanka women. Um, uh, he was fascinated by uh, the mysterious Tanka women who draw who, who, um, in, in their um, sampans and, and eggshell, eggshells, as we, uh, they were also known. So yes, he did, um, I think it was an interest, because he had lived in India as well, and he also painted British India before moving to Macau in 1825. So he, he had a strong interest in the exotic, uh, in, well, not the, ex well, the exoticized other, which those um, visual interpretations of him also uh, end up doing. They, 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 have a, 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 they also have a, what we could call a colonial interest. They make the other the exotic other. Is it a sort of Orientalism? So yeah, it to is. Say? Visual Orientalism. Visual Orientalism. It is yeah. visual Orientalism. Although um, it is, uh, we we can use them today to illustrate, for instance, Harriet Lowe's diaries, mm -hmm. and they are, uh, in visual terms, what those diaries are in mm -hmm. written terms. So they they um, complement each other in a very interesting way, and they are very um, realistic. Um, s visual sources on the everyday uh, life of 19th century Macau um, as well. Colors, the landscape, the streetscape, uh, the, you know, the Chinese barber, the blacksmith near the Ama temple, and he was very thorough, you know, the, even the movements. He, he um, rehearsed drawing the movements over and over and over again, so it's a very realistic and a very dynamic um, portrait of, of 19th century. Macau, especially the Chinese um, dimension or um, face of Macau. A while ago you were mentioning, and this is uh, also something that you've been uh, delving into, which is Chinese Pidgin English, and we were talking about that. You were earlier this month uh, here at the University of Macau uh, for a conference on this. Um, the uh, Tell us about the contribution of uh, First of all, what is Chinese Pidgin English for those who are not aware of that and the contribution of, uh, of, 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 of this to okay. English language as yes, we know it. As well, yes. Uh, well, uh, Pidgin is a trade language. It's, mm. it's, it's a language that um, originates in the interaction between Western traders and, um, in this case, Chinese traders and Chinese servants. So when the British arrived in, in Macau, uh, there was already the Portuguese Creole, which they first used to communicate with... Um, Which was the lingua franca back then, in a way, right? In the in south ways, of China, uh, yes. South of China, right. uh, So they used the, this Portuguese Creole. The first sentence that we have in a travel narrative in Chinese pidgin English is a Chinese servant asking uh, a, an English-speaking merchant, Kelish, pequena glen de hola, would you like a, 
would you like a tall or a short hor, hola? So most of the words are in Portuguese. And um, this very, uh, well, this pidgin, this trade language, is a very basic, linguistically speaking, it's a very basic, I mean, um, language. And expressions such as long time no see, yeah. no can do, yeah. were used. Hola, I'm walking as is long time no see, something yes. like that from Cantonese. It's yeah. a little translation yes. from Cantonese, yeah. yeah. Uh, so they, they were used by these English and American merchants, like the word savvy comes from the word, uh, from the verb saber in Portuguese. Uh, oh, that's, in English. that's interesting. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because the servant would first would have first have worked for the Portuguese. Savi no savi, right? Savi no savi, and he would he would answer his Portuguese either trading partner yeah. or um, employ employer. Eu não eu não sabe. And then when they was employed by the, the English, he would answer me no savi. Yeah. So the the word savi is Portuguese and enters the English language in the Macau Canton circuit in the. Uh, 18th and, and, and 19th century. So it was a trade language. Um, and these expressions, long time no see, no can do, uh, or the word savvy, um, entered the English language here in the Pearl River Delta and are still used today. It, it's, it's in, yeah, it's very it's amazing how, uh, well, uh, we look at these expressions as, of course, they're part of the English language everywhere, right? Uh, yes. Uh, I think, well, well, this is my theory. Um, and it, it's the one that makes more sense. These uh, traders were uh, from New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and they were very influential. The Forbes, the, Del the Delanos, uh, very you know, influential family. So they went back and they used Chinese pidgin English as a way to create an identity of China trade merchants. Mm -hmm. Like the ladies would wear ivory fans, silk dresses, and they would also, among themselves, to create a sense of identity, use expressions because they were funny, you know, um, Chinese pidgin English uh, expressions. And I think they were, must have been copied by social climbers and the people around them, and that's how uh, it spilled over. Uh and then they eventually, became part of the, yeah, English, language, part of the yes. English language. Yes. And there's fossil, exp even in Hong Kong today, when people say it happened on the Kowloon side, they say, where did that happen? Oh, Kowloon side. Mm -hmm. So that's also an expression from the Chinese pidgin English, which is still used today in, in Hong Kong. So it's a fossil, if we can call it that, um, expression that um, dates back from uh, the time when the Chinese pidgin English was also used in Hong Kong and the other treaty ports um, after the, the Opium War. Are there still many untold stories, I mean, uh, from these diaries, from other sources about the British presence in Macau, uh, particularly in the period that you um, have been uh, working on? I'm sure there are. I mean, I was able to, you know, as I said, research on the museum and then later on, on the first English language library in China, which was Macau and uh, Canton in the 19th century, of course, all these merchants and their wives who came to Macau, as they could not enter mainland China until the um, Opium War. They brought books and they left them in Macau. So a library was created, a reading club was created, and it had its own members. People could subscribe, pay a fee, and they could borrow books from the library. Half of the library, well, a part of the library was in Macau. The other part was taken by the merchants when they went up the Canton River, the Pearl River Delta, um, up to Canton. And that first uh, English language library in China then was sold, and it is now part of the Morrison Library at the Hong Kong, at the Hong Kong uh, University. So many of those books were the ones from this Macau Canton first English language library in China. I'm sure there, there's a lot of, of um, personal narratives in these diaries, in these sources, how uh, Macau, uh, as I've written, was the female space of the Canton trade. Because women were not allowed to enter China, they would travel from uh, the US, for instance, on the ship with their children, with the cow. If they had children, they would bring a cow, mm -hmm. because Chinese cows were not milked. So mm -hmm. they, there was no... Uh, Milk was not an easily accessible, the Chinese people did not drink milk at the time. So if they had children, they had to bring a cow. And even when people left, they left cows as a very valuable possession to their friends who stayed in Macau. Uh, and even milk was smuggled 
by the cow servants. So it was not because they were coming to Macau. That Mac was Macau, yeah. <laughs> no. cows, right? uh, yeah. Yeah, if they had children, that would be. So these diaries do reveal these small details that are very interesting and that we usually are not aware of. They also reveal personal um, narratives, for instance, the diary of Rebecca Kinsman. Oh, we haven't, yeah, we haven't mentioned that. That's, yeah. that's also a very interesting one, right? Yes, uh, who was a mother and uh, uh, the wife of Nathaniel Kinsman from Salem, uh, the witch town in the US near Boston. But, um, so they came to Macau and she became a widow. He died here in Macau. He's buried at a Protestant cemetery in Macau. And I went there several times and I read the diary and she mentions how she visited the grave of her husband and how there was a tree hanging over the, the grave of her husband and she picked up a leaf from the tree to take back to the US so that her children could have some kind of physical touch with the grave of, the, of their father. And the next time I went to the cemetery. I noticed that, that there was a tree hanging over the uh, the, um, the 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 grave of Nathaniel Kinsman. So there there are also uh, personal and family narratives, and um, there are a lot of um, not not a lot, but there are some Americans and English who come to Macau to visit the graves of their ancestors in the Protestant cemetery. So there's there's different dimensions to the Anglophone or the Portuguese or the Dutch or Danish or uh, or Swedish Macau, um, and it's this kaleidoscopic uh, image, this patchwork that we have to unite to be able to have a clear and realistic view of this also kaleidoscopic Macau. It was not just a Portuguese Macau, it was also, an, uh, of course, uh, it goes without saying, a Chinese Macau, a uh, Parsi Macau, an Indian Macau, uh, a uh, American Macau, and they all uh, had different spaces and they all shared different spaces. Uh, there was a male Macau, a female Macau. As I said, Macau was the female space of the China, old China trade because women were not allowed, foreign women were not allowed to enter China, so they would come and they would live in Macau. So Macau, and Rebecca Kinsman, when her husband was up in Macau during the, um, the autumn and winter months, she would take care of the business of her husband's firm. So she was not the passive housewife and mother just taking care of her children. She was also doing businesses as far as she could. Uh, or as well as she could. So that, in a way, ended up empowering those women, right? Yes, and ma making them a part of the China, the, the, the China trade, which is a very interesting. And uh, Macau allowed it, allowed these women to get involved and to be closer to their husbands rather than just staying at home uh, in back in the United States. And these diaries were sent back to the United States. They were read by whole streets, whole neighborhoods. So they were. Uh, part of what we could call amateur sino uh, the, uh, the early amateur sinology in the United States. So people learned about Chinese customs, Chinese traditions, uh, the Chinese language, uh, the Chinese way of, 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 of um, well, Chinese festivities through these journals because they, these women also functioned as cultural translators because they had to explain everything that they were talking about to their relatives back in the United States. So, um, they are amazing uh, and very entertaining sources, historical sources. In terms of research, what's next? I mean, uh, you've covered extensively the period between before the 18th century and then the establishment of the first British in Macau in the 18th century, and then throughout uh, the uh, first decades of the 19th century, but then um, it's basically until 1834, right? Uh, uh, well, my most thorough, well, I studied up to the Lord McCartney's embassy, so 1793, 94. I would like to continue to continue until study until the Opium War. After the Opium War, the British and the American North American presence in Macau up to 1842, when the exodus to Hong okay. Kong slowly starts and it changes the regional and national and international importance of Macau. Not forever. Um, but yes, so that is due, the, the British presence in Macau from Lord McCartney. After Lord embassy McCartney's embassy until... To the founding of, of, of uh, Hong Kong, yes. Because even the, because the, of the failed embassy, the British embassy, the image of China in Europe changes. It goes from a, ver from a positive image to a negative image because 
civilization needed was needed in, so it was like an excuse for imposing british interests in in china and it it ended in the opium war as 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 we all know it was the, the rhetorics of the white man's burden mm -hmm, so right. if you we still do it today yes. regarding countries in the far east you know just because we need their their um, petrol so we demonize them and they need civil they need uh, <laughs> to be rescued from whatever it is but um so it's very interesting to also to see how the the the, the rhetorics and the image of a country changes according to the needs of whoever is writing and manipulating that image. Uh, and it happened also in Sino-Western relationships. Any plans for further research in this uh, yes, well, so, respect? Uh, yes, and also uh, Anglophone writing on Hong Kong. So I would like to uh, also uh, do some comparative studies on the representation of early Hong Kong and Macau at the same time. Uh, which I'm sure will be very interesting, at least for me. <laughs> sure, uh, and for many of our <laughs> viewers as well, I'm sure. So that would, uh, I'm hoping to do that and, and to continue analyzing both travel writing and fictional writing novels on Macau by uh, English-speaking writers. Um, to basically continue what I've done until now. There's a lot to be done, there's still a lot to be done. It's enough for... It's a research agenda, so yes. to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> a very interesting agenda. Uh, Professor Rogério Puga, thank you very much thank for very much. sharing this with us, for joining us. It was a pleasure and thank you for having me. Pleasure to have you on the show. Okay, thank Fascinating you very stuff. Much. And to you at home, thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week.